Hello, so this lecture will cover enzymes, which is chapter six of our textbook. This is just a little bit of a friendly reminder that's trying to really encourage you all to read these chapters. This particular section of the course is very challenging for a lot of students. Um, and the best kept secret I think we have is reading. So make sure that you read and you don't just rely on the videos or the notes that I have to get you through this. Okay, so an enzyme. An enzyme is a protein catalyst, right? So as we talk about which macromolecule enzymes come from, I want you to not ever forget that an enzyme is a protein. We will also discuss what a catalyst is, um, but the two of these together, a protein catalyst, is what an enzyme is, and that's going to help to speed up our reactions. Enzymes can catalyze reactions. So the term catalyze just means bring together and kind of occur pretty quickly, and an enzyme can do that. Another very important thing about an enzyme is they all end in ACE. So most enzymes are going to be something like, let's say, um, tablidase, right? Anytime you see something that ends with ASE, you can think of this as being an enzyme. So an enzyme is a protein, an enzyme will help to speed up reactions, and an enzyme always ends in the letters ASE. So a lot of our reactions that occur in the body are spontaneous, meaning we don't have to do anything for the reaction to occur, but just because something is spontaneous does not necessarily mean it's fast. So by having a catalyst around, that is going to kind of speed up the rate of that chemical reaction. Um, and one great thing about a catalyst is we don't use it or consume it during the reaction. So you, would con you can have a thousand reactions, but you will never decrease the number of enzymes present because we don't consume them or use them. Um, think of it like a cake, right? So if you're mixing up a cake in a bowl, you can put 1,000 cake batter or mixes in that bowl, but the bowl is never going to go away. The spoon is never going to go away. Those are things that will speed up the mixing of the cake, but they are not consumed during that reaction. So like I said, an enzyme is going to be a protein catalyst that you find in cells. So it's going to be an, a biological item that speeds up the reaction, and it's actually a protein. Um, so that's something, just a little bit more information about those enzymes. This is a great example showing what an enzyme will do to a reaction. So on the bottom, it's this little car that does not have the enzyme. And towards the top, you see the car with the enzyme. It's speeding past it. It's going faster. So if an enzyme is present, it is going to speed up the reaction. The way that enzymes help to speed up the reaction is lower the EA. So EA stands for activation energy. Um, and activation energy is what you need to start the reaction. So let's say you um, are on a swing. That's a great example. So let's say um, you're on a swing. Please forgive me <laughs> with my drawing of you on a swing. Oh, it's the funny looking swing, huh? Let's say that's you on the swing, you're sitting there. Um, I don't know what happened to your neck, <laughs> but you're on a swing, right? Activation energy would be the person next to you that has to push you on that swing, right? So the person that's doing the pushing, the act of pushing is the activation energy. It's the energy needed to get the swing moving and going, right? You're going to need some type of energy to push that swing. So that's what activation energy is. It's the energy needed to start a reaction. So enzymes help to lower it. So instead of pushing very hard, an enzyme will help you to push very lightly, but still get the swing moving. Anybody that's ran track and field before, you might have recognized these hurdles. Um, so if you are running on the hurdles, the intent is you run along and then you jump over each hurdle as you go around the track. This hurdle in the middle is obviously a lot taller. It's going to take a lot more energy to jump all the way over that hurdle and keep going. 
So an enzyme helps to lower that activation energy. It helps to bring it down. So as you're running along, it's going to take less energy to jump over this height of a hurdle as compared to a much higher hurdle there. Now, we have to ask ourselves, how does the enzyme lower the activation energy? So I told you they work by lowering that, but we need to think about how does that work? That's really important, especially for questions in which I say, explain how this occurs, explain why this occurs. This is where we want to focus. So an enzyme lowers the activation energy by doing two things. It's either going to push things apart, right? It's going to push apart or pull apart. We call that straining the reaction. So let's say these part of the reaction is taking um, something that's red and then something that's green and separating them. We want them to separate. The enzyme can work to make sure that the green goes way over here and the red goes way over here. So it essentially just pushes them or pulls them apart. The opposite is what happens when we want to put our reactants close together. So sometimes, let's say we're making that cake, we want to take the sugar and the butter and the flour and push it together very fast. So in that sense, we're going to just be going the opposite way, right? So we're going to be taking something that's far apart and trying to push it close together. Um, and then we'll make sure we draw a green circle and then show how it goes close together. So an enzyme is either going to pull something apart or it's going to basically push something together. So if we're breaking something down, an enzyme will speed up how fast we pull it apart. If our reaction is putting something together, it will speed up how fast we push it together. So there are some key enzyme terms that I want to discuss that are going to really help you um, understand how an enzyme works. So this is a typical structure. You're going to have an enzyme that's in the middle and on the enzyme, you're going to notice that there is a portion of the enzyme that's kind of like a cutout. So it's, it's expecting something to land there. So we will talk about this item and then we will also talk about the item that fits into that perfectly designed cutout space. So the space that's cut out, that little, in this case, it's like a little zigzag piece here on the enzyme is called the active site. So this is where that entire reaction occurs. This is where we're going to either pull something apart or push it together, right? In the active site, very critical active site is found within the enzyme. So I'll try to also draw some of my pictures on the right just to give you another visualization. So this little slit here, this would be the active site of the enzyme. The second item here is called a substrate. A substrate is going to be the reactants that bind to the active site. So in this case, uh, this little purple area here across the top is going to be our substrate. So that's going to be what fits inside the active site right here, purple. Um, if I was drawing an item or completing my picture right here, it will be, let's say, something that looks like that, right? You're going to see a similarity in the shape. So that will be our substrate. This is going to bind within the active site. And then once we have our entire at enzyme and substrate together, we call that the enzyme substrate complex. So let's say we have, um, I'll try to redraw my enzyme. So once that entire uh, sub, once that entire complex is together, that is the enzyme substrate complex. Finally, enzymes are typically named after what they affect. So for instance, if you had an enzyme called um, sucrase, you see it ends in A-S-E, that most likely will help to break apart sucrose which if you remember is a carbohydrate that we talked about before in class. So enzymes are going to be named after what they affect. 
Because of that, enzymes are extremely specific. So they have what we call high specificity. They're extremely specific. We have high specificity. In this picture here, you see the active site is this little cutout space here. The enzyme is the blue uh, structure. And then finally, this red item here is our substrate. So in the picture here, we have a complete enzyme substrate complex in which our substrate is lodged right there with a perfect fit inside of our active site, which is housed within our enzyme. Again, showing how enzymes are specific. This is documenting another example of an enzyme. You see this is lactase, A-S-E, it's an enzyme. And it's going to work with lactose, which is a carbohydrate. So lactose will fit perfectly into lactase. You see, you got a circle, you got a hexagon. It fits right nicely into this active site here. Um, again, this is going to be an example of pulling them apart. Remember, they can either push them together or pull them apart. This is going to be an enzyme that essentially pulls it apart. Um, this is showing sucrose, which is a different carbohydrate. And because enzymes are specific, sucrose will not be able to fit into lactase. You see, it doesn't fit. Some parts of it might fit, but the entire, um, the entire substrate will not be able to correctly fit into the enzyme. Because enzymes are so specific and because they have a very, very particular substrate of an active site matching, we usually think of enzymes as being like a lock and a key. So everyone's familiar with locks and keys. Think of your key as being your substrate, right? It's going to be an item that will specifically fit somewhere. Think of your key hole, right? The little hole right there on the lock or the lock hole, but it's typically called a keyhole. Um, that is going to be your active site. That's going to be where your substrate or your key will fit. And then the lock itself will be representative of the enzyme. So the same way we can see a key and a lock form a lock key complex, we can draw a parallel and see that with our substrate, which is like the key, the active sign, active site, which is like the keyhole, and then the enzyme, which is green, we can see a, a very clear parallel or similarity between an enzyme and substrate and a key and a lock. So anytime I refer to the lock and key metaphor, that's what I'm referring to. One of the reasons that happens is because we have the induced fit phenomena. So this occurs... Um, Whenever we put that key in the lock, you have a small change in the shape of the enzyme. So a, somewhat of a conformational change. And I'm going to show you a picture that should help describe it just a little bit. So when you're looking at this enzyme here, you see we add the substrate into the enzyme. If you notice, the enzyme shape will change just slightly. So for here, you have, you know, kind of a small circle. Um, and then once the substrate binds, the enzyme shape will change. When it changes the shape, that's going to be what helps to either pull that substrate apart or push it together, right? So imagine if the enzyme opened up, that's going to be pulling it apart. Imagine if the enzyme closed together, that's going to be kind of pushing it together. So all of those things are going to be known as our induced fit model. Again, this is showing the same thing here. You have an enzyme with a few substrates that are going to bind. That enzyme undergoes a shape change or conformational change. Those substrates are then converted to a product. And then finally, your enzyme is prepared to do this again. One of the reasons enzymes work so well is because of the term affinity. So you might have remembered this when we talked about um, electrons with electromagnetic affinity and how bigger atoms have a higher affinity for electrons. So affinity is just the attraction that an enzyme has for a substrate. So affinity can be strong. What that means is that means if I have, um, let's say I have um, one enzyme and somewhere far else in the body, I have one substrate. 
if the affinity is high, that enzyme is going to do whatever it has to do to get down to this substrate so that we can form the enzyme substrate complex. That means it's going to bind the substrate even when there's very low concentrations of the substrate around. Okay, so even if there's just one present, it's going to find it. It's, it has a very high affinity or very high want or need to want to get to that substrate. The flip side is that an affinity can be weak. So in this case, if you have an enzyme around, you're going to need to have lots and lots and lots and lots of substrates close by for it to say, okay, I, gu I guess I'll interact with this substrate. I guess I'll interact with this substrate. It only binds when there is a high substrate concentration, almost like when it's forced, right? So um, there's not really many other options around and everything it binds with is so close by, it just naturally interacts with it. So that's the difference between a high or a weak affinity. So these are some questions that I've put in the slideshow, but what we can do is save these for class so that we can work through them together. So this ends our enzyme presentation. Um, and if you have any questions, please let me know. We can cover them or discuss them in class.